Samingus Campbell, welcome to Chat Politics. Thanks for joining us. I think you were christened Walter Mingus Campbell, so wouldn't it have been simpler to stick with Walter? My mother was a woman of uh, great common sense. Mm. And in our family, it was Walter and George for about five or six generations. My father was George, I had to be Walter. My mother said very firmly, you can't send a boy out into the world with the initials WC. Uh, and as a result, something else had to be found. One of my great grandfather's children married a Mingus. Yes. So that's how it's in the family. And since I played rugby and since I was a wing three quarter, it wasn't very long before Mingus was mm. reduced to Ming. You mentioned your sport there. As an athlete, you captained the great British uh, athletics team in 65 and 66, I yeah. think it was. Uh, and you held the British. 100 metre sprint record for a number of years. Yeah. Do you still run? No, I've got a bad hip. And the reason I have a bad hip is I had a tumour on it uh, 11 years ago, something called non Hodgkin lymphoma. I try and walk as much as I can, but to some extent I'm uh, rather restricted. In due course, I'll have to have my hip replaced, but then a lot of people of my age do have to have that. Yeah. Do you find sport as a career more rewarding than that of politics? Well, it was, certainly wasn't rewarding in a financial sense. I mean, when we went to the Olympic Games in 1964, we got $2 a day pocket money, out of which we had to pay for our own laundry. Right. Um, I don't think I ever got, I, I never got any payment of any kind. Once, I think, my expenses um, at a meeting in Wales mm. had an unexpected additional £5 note in them. Uh, and in those days as a yeah. student uh, five pounds was yeah. a great deal of money well, it still is um, <laughs> so um, I always say we were the last of the amateurs and the first of the professionals amateurs because we weren't paid but professionals because we had to try and train to the same intensity as the Americans who then had that very very effective mm. college system they still have a college system but perhaps not quite so effective and those behind the Iron Curtain whom we now know were laced with steroids at every turn. Yes. Why the transition from athletics to politics? Was there something that connected the two for you? It was never a transition. When I was at university in Glasgow, there was a very strong debating tradition. And the debates at Glasgow were conducted on a kind of political, yeah. long political lines. So there were six political clubs, and each took turn to form a, a, a government and to present a motion to the House, okay. rather like what we uh, do here. And I was always very interested, surrounded by contemporaries like John Smith, who led the Labour Party, Donald Dewar, who was uh, Secretary of State for Scotland, then First Minister in the devolved Parliament. Um, and uh, I kept the, the, the politics and the athletics, very occasionally the work, mm. was supposed to march side by side. Do you think that those who go straight into politics without having a career elsewhere are likely to be out of touch with real people's concerns? Well, that's a charge that's often made, and I think sometimes it's true. I mean, in my case, I was a lawyer, I was a, mm. a, an advocate, the Scottish equivalent of a barrister. Uh, but when I was starting out in law, I did quite a lot of matrimonial work, yep. understanding just what sort of stresses and strains there were in family life. Also, just how poor in those days the financial provision was for women and children in the event that there was a divorce. And I also did, uh, in those days, quite a bit of crime, defending uh, murder trials and things of that kind. And you certainly learn from mm. uh, that experience just exactly how different the lives is of many people from what you see reflected on television or, what, or from what your own experience is. Do you think it's perceived that way by, by the public? I think there's a general public disaffection with politicians, but as my wife observed to me the other day, there's a general public disaffection with bankers, with the National Health Service, uh, with lawyers, um, w with politicians. Uh, great sort of institutions now have come under a great deal of criticism. I think there's a reason for that, and it is a far greater degree of transparency. Uh, I don't think in any of these institutions were any better or any worse in the past, but there was much less transparency. And that's a function, of course, of the um, information technology revolution. Mm. And along with that has gone a demand, really, from the public for a higher, greater degree of accountability. And that's possible because the public now have access 
to a far wider range of information. Yeah. I mean, for example, when I was growing up, a doctor came to see you it was mm. th as if the Queen had arrived. Um, and nowadays, of course, you'd be quizzing the doctor, and if he didn't come on time, you'd be complaining. Mm. You famously rejected Gordon Brown's 2007 offer for two senior Liberal Democrats to join his cabinet. Do you think a coalition between the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party in 2015, would, would, would that be workable? Well, no one can answer that question, because it will be about two things. The first thing it will be about is numbers, mm -hmm. and that's why the efforts in 2010 to forge a, a relationship yeah. between the Liberal Democrats and Labour eventually founded, because there wasn't an overall majority. And the, any coalition would have had to rely on the Scottish Nationalists, the Welsh, the, the, Welsh Na the Ulster Unionists, and, and, and the sole Green <coughs> every night at 10 o'clock, otherwise yes. you'd lose your business. Um, and the second question then, apart from numbers, is policy. Uh, whether there would be a sufficient meeting of minds on policy. There's another point, a third sort of slightly subsidiary point, mm. which is Lib Dems have learned a lot about coalition. Uh, we're not quite as green, uh, nothing to do with the environment, but, but we're not quite as green as we were. Yeah. Uh, and we would be wanting in any coalition with any party now to drive a much harder bargain than was driven in 2010. Mm. On that note then, do you think the Liberal Democrats will be playing a game of tactics in the upcoming Well, the, the, um, Nick Clegg quite rightly has stated the position. Uh, when it comes to the economy, you can't trust Labour. When it comes to fairness, uh, you can't trust the Tories. The only party that seeks to marry these two fundamental issues mm. together is the Liberal Democrats. The chances are, though, that one of Labour or the Tories is going to be in the driving position after that election. Well, they'll know what the, uh, the they'll know what, what the shopping list is yes. in a way that they simply didn't in 2010. Mm. Following your resignation as the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Nick Clegg said he'd been the victim of appalling age discrimination. How much of an effect did ageing have on, on that uh, ultimate decision to resign? Well, when Charles Kennedy had to step down, I had three objectives. The first was to restore uh, balance, stability in the party, and I managed to do that. The second was to make the party more efficient, mm. and I managed to do that as well, though not as far as I would have liked. A lot of resistance to efficiency among the Liberal Democrats. And the third was to prepare for a general election, because we all believed, uh, with justification, that Blair would step down at some stage, yes. and that Brown would seek his own mandate. And that is, of course, is. Uh, uh, we prepared for that. Uh, I, everyone thought, including a lot of people in the Labour Party, there was going to be a general election in autumn 2007. And uh, one day, one Saturday afternoon, I spent nine hours in the chair of two consecutive meetings, yes. getting the manifesto together. Uh, and my programme for the election, the leaders' tour, was about 70 or 80 percent um, penciled in, more than that, inked in in many, mm. many cases. And indeed, the helicopters were uh, ordered. I mean, we were, we were ready to go. Yes. Um, and at that point, 2007, uh, having got close to the election and drawn back, it was very clear to me that he couldn't possibly go until 2010, until the end, the natural end of the parliament. Otherwise, he was going to look very, very foolish. And that would have meant in 2010 by which days I was going to be 69. Uh, and of course I had cancer, but I'd recovered, I, my stamina was back. But there was just this constant snipe, 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 sniping away. And it seemed to me if I was going to go, it was better to go early, so that whoever replaced me would have a good run, chance of a run-in before the general election in mm. 2010. Foreign policy was perhaps what you were most involved with during your time in politics. And you criticised Labour's decision to go into go Iraq. War against Iraq. Mm. Do you think Blair was being deliberately deceptive, or do you think he was just honestly mistaken? There's a parallel some people often draw. Uh, Blair's like Don Giovanni, he believed it when he said it. Now, I think he did believe it, uh, but in my view, fundamentally wrong. And the fundamental problem 
was the fact that he adopted an approach towards the United States which can be summed up rather tritely as my ally right or wrong. He was determined under no circumstances to be separated away from the United States. And I think he was, um, I mean, I've met George W. Bush. He's yeah. very persuasive. He's very personable. He's not the sort of joke figure that he was painted. Uh, and I think Blair was simply bowled over by that. You were also critical of that Blair-Bush relationship. How do you think the UK should have acted differently in that regard? Well, Charles Kennedy had a very good expression for it. He said we should be a candid friend. Uh, and have a relationship with the United States which recognise the fact that they are our closest ally mm. but that there would be occasions when we disapproved of what they did or when we simply didn't agree with what they did or wanted to do. A far and less attractive position from the point of view of the United States. Well, yes and no, uh, because I mean, I was a postgraduate student in the United States a long time ago and I kept a very strong interest in, mm. in American politics. Um, less attractive perhaps in the White House of the time, but certainly with a bit more resonance uh, elsewhere up on Capitol Hill, yeah. where 28 senators, including a very good friend of mine, voted against going into Iraq. Uh, uh, and. Um, uh, a bit more independence by Britain, um, which had been uh, had come to be seen by the White House as being an essential sort of linchpin in the adventure. A bit more independence by Britain would certainly have raised more doubts among people, uh, and by that I mean in the administration on on Capitol Hill mm. and indeed in the public. So if we had been less, much less forgive the colloquialism, gung-ho, then that might well have had an effect on, on yeah. US policy. Towards the end of last year, you announced your intentions to stand down as mm. an MP at the upcoming general election. Looking back on your political career, would you say it has been a success? No, I can't possibly answer that question. You must ask other people. <laughs> and you must wait 10 years after I die before, <laughs> before you ask it and ex expect any answer. Well, Look. Uh, I mean, I've had three lives. Um, I was an international athlete. Yes. Uh, I was Queen's Council, still a, still a Queen's Council, and I led the Liberal Democrats. Um, and uh, I mean, I have actually a rather nasty competitive streak, which I managed to conceal. You want to lose your race, you want to lose your case, and you want to lose your seat. Mm. Uh, so I've got absolutely no complaints, but it's for others to judge whether it's been successful or not. Mm. I think there's speculation that perhaps you'll be offered a seat in the House of Lords. Um, would you like that? Well, I keep saying I'm retiring from the House of Commons, but not from politics. Uh, and um, uh, no, I mean, none of so these... So that's a yes. <laughs> yeah, no, well, none of these things are certainties. They depend upon the um, circumstances of, of the course, time. Yeah. They depend upon numbers. They depend upon luck. Hmm. Uh, they depend upon who's leader. I mean, there's a, whole, there's a range of variables. So I'm not, yeah. uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not counting any. Ch I'm not no, counting of course, any. Ch you, you sound keen, but I think the, the Liberal Democrats as a party, their position, and indeed yourself, do you think that the Lords actually needs radical reform? Well, I, I, I voted for all of the proposals to um, abolish it in its present form, not to abolish it completely, yes, but to change it. Uh, and it seemed to me 80% elected and 20% appointed was a per perfectly reasonable balance to strike. Mm. How much do you think the parliamentary expenses scandal damaged the population's belief in the oh, political system? Very considerably. We had a loose system which was poorly administered. Yeah. Now, there were some people, they paid the price, who uh, conducted themselves in a way which produced criminal charges. Mm. A number of them have paid the price for that. Uh, but. And, and part of it, but not all of it, to the, not, certainly not to the extent it's claimed, part of that was a reaction against the fact that every time there was a moment at which the salaries of MPs ought to be increased, and that they never were. And it was often because, there were, I mean, if you remember the Cabinet, for example, now, you earn 140, 150,000 a year. If you're a member of Parliament, you earn 66 or whatever it is. Uh, I'm not saying members of Parliament 
<laughs> don't work hard. But a lot of MPs work just as hard in many yeah. ways, especially in marginal seats. And so um, b b with that, I mean, when I first got in, uh, there was a grade in the civil service that we were attached to. We yeah. got nine tenths of that grade. Then it got abolished. Very un very, I mean, the advantage of a grade was every time that grade got an increase, then we got an increase as well, a proportionate increase. Um, and the, the, then we were told that we would be equivalent roughly to a, um, a medium-sized, um, a partner in a medium-sized medical practice, GP. Well, they now earn 100,000 a year, yeah. by and large, and some very, very great deal more than that. And then we were told, all right, um, the salary of um, a medium uh, headmaster, head teacher of a medium sized comprehensive school. Well, they certainly earn a lot more than 66,000. Mm. And part of the problem has always been um, that the prime ministers of the day, uh, certainly after Howard Wilson, had other sources of income. Uh, well, and, and except John Major too, but he only did sort of five or six years. And so when it came to any question of salaries, they were able to, they put it this way, their hair shirt was a little smoother than the hair shirt of the rest of us. You mentioned that that expenses scandal did put people off and perhaps disengage young people as well. You yourself claimed, I think, spending £10,000 uh, on redesigning your, your London flat, that that sort of behaviour was within the spirit of the well, rules. I asked for permission and I got it. Mm. So it may be within the rules. Does it make it right? Well, most certainly. I mean, it's a flat which uh, I had um, rented myself. Uh, I had rented it for 23 years. Uh, and it had begun not so... My wife and I had paid to fit it out when we first took it. And after 23 years, it began to get a bit frayed at the edges. Uh, and um, I could, for example, have been in a very much more expensive flat. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's, I still, I'm still in it. It's a one-room flat, it's a, a studio flat. It's about half the size of my office. People don't believe that. That's actually true. Mm. And um, uh, so having... Um, uh, not incurred. For example, one thing I didn't do, I didn't buy a, a, a house and then use the uh, m money available for housing uh, to pay the interest on a mortgage. And also, no, no capital gain ever came to me. So, over the piece, I believed I was entitled at the time. And the, uh, the, um, the, um, the reaction was as one might expect. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered been the Archangel Gabriel. I mean, once the um, once the uh, sort of cover was lifted, then um, everyone was yeah. everyone was condemned. I suppose one might make a comparison to whether uh, corporations should aggressively avoid paying uh, taxes. Would you say that's within the rules? That that's fine too. What that that um, that corporations well, that they try and avoid it, it's well, within the rules, but it, does that make it right? It, well, it's the definition of evasion and avoidance. Mm. Well, evasion's criminal offence. Avoidance uh, uh, is perhaps on a, something like a sliding scale. I mean, if you're a massive coffee selling operation, to name no names, <laughs> and you have outlets all over the United Kingdom, and somehow you appear to pay a fraction of corporation tax, uh, then perhaps that is a case where the spirit, if you like, has not been observed. It's never too late to pay your taxes, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, how do you think the public see the Liberal Democrats' role in the current government? Well, it hasn't all been plain sailing, but then it, ne it was never going to be easy. Um, and um, I mean, there's no, we've achieved a, a huge amount. And people who, if you like, uh, experts, analysts say yeah. they believe that the coalition will be remarkably successful because the possibility of all kinds of uh, fallouts uh, has, by and large, been avoided. Of course, there's been mm. some trouble, some differences of opinion. But um, uh, it seems to me that our task now in the next 15, 16 months is to ensure that we get credit for what, what we've done. Principle, question, principle issue has been that of economic stability. And without us, 
then the Conservatives could not have formed uh, a government other than a minority government which would have lasted a few months. And at that particular point, May 2010, if there had been a further four or five months uncertainty, government, they'd have been allowed to form a minority government. The Queen couldn't have stopped. The Queen would have been obliged to call Cameron and say, can you do it? He'd have said yes. But after about four or five months, he'd have been forced to go to the country again to say, I'm not able to impose my manifesto. Now, what does anyone think would have happened in these four or five months? Uh, I mean, it's worth remembering that when Alistair Darling was Chancellor, he was in Brussels for a meeting, right. and he was rung up by the chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland one afternoon at about two o'clock, mm. who said, I must see you urgently, Chancellor. And Alistair Darling said, well, I'm in Brussels, but I'll be back at the weekend. I can see you on Monday. There was a long pause at the other end of the telephone, and the chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland said, if we don't do something before four o'clock, we'll have to close down the ATM machines. Now, that was how fragile it was at that stage. Yeah. Uh, Gordon Brown and uh, Alistair Darling made frantic efforts to try and restore stability. And to some extent, they were successful. But if we'd had four or five months in which who was going to be the government and what was going to be the government were the two principal political questions to be asked, then you could easily have had a run on the pound, run on the stock market, yeah. Uh, and the bond market would have moved very, very significantly against you. Uh, and that would have made the recovery, which we're now seeing the beginning of, that would have made the recovery uh, not only v not just very difficult, it might have made it impossible. We might have found ourselves defaulting. I mean, it was as close as that. So yeah. the Lib yeah. Dems hadn't been there to provide the, the bridge, if you like. And, um, Were you reluctant at first to go into coalition with the Conservatives? Well, um, I, I mean, it's no secret. I had some reservations about yeah. it. But I was, com I was um, persuaded by the economic imperative. Because without that, I think the period of uncertainty would have been hugely, hugely damaging. Finally, we'll be chatting to Alistair Campbell before the weekend. Right. Um, is there anything you'd like us to ask him? <laughs> He's still playing the bagpipes. <laughs> we'll do just that. I should say, Alistair, Alistair Campbell, my father's name, I mean, he, his name was George, like mine was yeah. Walter, but he was, uh, he was always called Alistair. So I don't look at Alistair Campbell thinking of him as a father figure. Let, yeah. me, let, me, be, uh, let me be clear about that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very sure sign of his um, Highland antecedents. Thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate right. it. Thank you.